The views and opinions of the guests of Veterans Archives do not reflect the views and opinions of Veterans Archives, its subsidiaries, or its partners. Hello and welcome to Veterans Archives. This is a podcast where you can learn about our military history in the words and voices of the men and women who lived and created it. I'm your host, Bill Krieger, and let's listen to our next story. We are here today with Joel Burkhart. It is August 30th, 2023. How are you doing today, Joel? I'm doing outstanding. Hey, thanks for uh, doing this, Brian. It's a pretty cool opportunity. Well, I'm glad to do it. So today we're going to talk a little bit about about you, your military experiences, where where you're from, some of the important times you had, um, those types of things. Sound good to you? Absolutely. Let's uh, let's do it. All right. So tell me about where you are from. Well, I'm from. One more. Oh, hold on one yep. second. Sorry. Joel served in the Army National Guard for about 22 years. Yeah, that's right. So about 22 years, I've been uh, in the Michigan Army National Guard. Um, currently about to retire from the Michigan Army National Guard on my transitional leave now. I retire October 1st of this year, 2023. Um, it all started, you know, right here in Michigan. I've been a, a Michigan kid, born and raised, born in Hillsdale County in Michigan um, on a, a farm, small, small area in southern Michigan. Um, joined the Michigan Army National Guard when I was 17, junior in high school. Really was looking to get into law enforcement. Um, joined as a military policeman with the 1776 MP company out of Taylor. Um, we're we're uh where uh what high school did you go to so i went to a really really small school called camden frontier it's in the mm-hmm. very southern um, middle part of michigan right on the ohio indiana border about seven miles from the ohio border about 10 miles from the indiana border kind of right on the the tri-state area of all three um like i said very very small school you know graduated with you know less than 100 kids in our class um really was looking to get into law enforcement after after high did you, school did you have any siblings growing up yeah, I did. So I grew up with uh, two brothers, um, mom and dad, and two brothers. One was older, one was younger. I was the the middle child out of the out of the group. Uh, my older brother, actually, both my brothers ended up going to Central Michigan University. Um, for me, you know, I, I really I looked at family was was really big to me, and, and my grandpa uh, was a big impact in my life. Um, no longer with us, but uh, Sorry to hear he, that. he was a a big influence to in me, and he was a Korean war veteran with the Marine Corps. Um, and his time, you know, he had told me stories of, you know, him serving and it was something that really was memorable to him. And and it meant a lot of time. It meant a lot for him, you know, his service to the country. So it was something that I kind of wanted to do to follow him as well. And it really aligned with me wanting to get into law enforcement. Um, so I decided I was going to join the Michigan Army National Guard. I talked to a, a recruiter, and they were the first ones that talked to me at 17. Um, so was, was that you were, you were in high school? It came in high school? I was. Yep, 17. And what year was that? 2001. So I actually joined in on December 13th, 2001. I joined the, the Michigan Army National Guard, went to MEPS, took my physical, and joined. How, so how were your... Tell me a little bit about your parents and how, how they, yeah, so who they that were, was, how did they, did that they was like a, it? Or? A very interesting conversation. So I was, you know, 17 at the time, uh, headstrong to say the least. Um, my mom was very supportive of whatever I wanted to do, um, as well as, you know, my brothers. She, you know, if we were going to make the decision and, and kind of do what we want to do, she was going to be there to support it. Um, at the time, my dad was... Uh, not, we would say, um, very supportive in it. And you got to think that the time frame was October, November, when I first started talking about this of 2001. Mm-hmm. So September 11th was very fresh. Um, we were just kicking a lot of things off. Uh, you know, overseas, nobody really knew the stability of really what was going on in the world at that time. Did, um, did your friend, so it's 2000, 2011 just happened while you were in high school. Did your friends like, nine eleven two thousand one? Yep. Yep. Did did uh? I mean, was it like a lot of the kids in your school like wanting to join or so? How was the, no? It's a it's a very conservative area. Um, I grew up in, and you know there there was people, um, 
who had joined, I actually joined with a group of a couple other kids um, out of the Branch Area Career Center. We were all in a criminal justice program. Um, and, and there was, there was three of us ended up joining. Um, I was the only one that stuck with it and made it through the whole way. Uh, but there was a, a small group of us that, that joined together. Um, I think more so for career wise things than, than anything else, but no, it wasn't like there was a lot of people joining the military from the area that I was in. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of influences, you know, that, that did push me for that direction. But I can say, um, in my high school time frame, you know, my principal at the time was a retired colonel from the active duty army. Um, and once I had made the decision, he was very supportive of me and, you know, talked me through a lot of things that kind of helped me along the way in that early, early stage of my career. So yeah, junior in high school joined, um, in December, December 13th, 2001, um, joined the guard, ended up going to basic training, uh, between my junior and senior year that summer between my junior split and senior op. year. Yep. As a split op. So I came back, I finished my high school year, um, as a senior started drilling, uh, with the MP company out of Taylor. Um, and then after my senior year, uh, I actually had started working for a recruiter. I came on ADOS orders at the time uh, as a recruiter's assistant until I could, uh, you know, get back to MP school. And so, so where, so as far as basic training, what year did you go to basic training and where were you? So at? I went to basic training in June of 2002. Um, went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Okay. Went do you remember your spent, drill sergeants at all? You know, I do. There was a guy named Drill Sergeant Berceau. Um, God, I wish I could look him up somewhere and even find out if he was still around or still alive. Um, but yeah, Drill Sergeant Berceau was my basic training drill sergeant. And I actually... Who was the... Re do you remember your recruiter? Oh, man. I think it was a guy. His last name was Franks. And I do know that he's not around anymore because I don't even think he was around after I had joined to, by the time I went to base training, I don't even think he was around anymore. So okay. I know that he was, he didn't make it very much longer after that. Um, but I do remember his name, but yeah, drill sergeant Brasuo and basic training in Fort Leonard Wood, like I said, June of 2002, um, graduated, came back and I was actually in a, a full military police school. Was um, there anyone in basic training you that you remember hanging out with and like going through so that's a, a good good question there too brian uh i had a guy who was actually from michigan too he's from um up by the bridge area right around the mackinac bridge uh, his name is joe cooper still friends with him on social media all uh, right he went through basic training with me we were battle buddies um stayed in contact with him you know throughout the last 22 years uh, you know, limited contact, don't seem, don't spend time together. Our families don't get together or anything like that, but still friends on social media. So it kind of can track and see where he's been, but he is the only one that, um, I've stayed in contact with from that time for sure. Okay. Well, that's cool. I mean, you're at somewhere, some like common ground when you get to basic training, I know like you're in Absolutely. a swarm of people from all over. So, yeah, it was definitely a different experience, you know, coming from being a, a small farm kid you know, to never really been out of the state of Michigan to basic training in 2002 as a 17 year old kid with, you know, meeting people from Los Angeles that had never seen a cornfield before or meeting people <laughs> from, you know, uh, Louisiana who lived on the bayou and, you know, talked about alligator hunting and, and things like that. You know, just a, a mixture of cultural differences that, uh, you know, I'd never experienced as 17 years old and, you know, living where I had lived the whole time. Um, you know, like I said, grew up on a farm, uh, did what we did around the area, but there wasn't a whole lot of expanding from there until I really joined the army and, and saw what the rest of the world kind of did and yeah. how they lived and heard stories from everywhere else, you know, kind of being able to tell my story, you know, listening to their stories as well. Um, so yeah, it was a really great experience. Um, finished that up in, Right before school had started, so August, I think we were down there for 10, 11 weeks um, of basic training uh, and then finished that up, came back home, finished high school, uh, graduated high school, and I had that summer, like I said, I started working for a recruiter um, as a recruiter's assistant before MP school started. Uh, October of 2023, I went back to... Who was the recruiter that you worked for? So I started working for a guy named Sergeant First Class Sean Miller. Yeah, so I know Sean Miller. He brought me on as a recruiter assistant, um, worked for him for 
quite a while. I worked for him even after I got back from uh, MP school. Did a lot of things with Sean, saw a lot of things, learned a lot of things. Um, went back to MP school, graduated, came back home, uh, was supposed to go on a deployment that got canceled. So when you went to MP school, I was back at Fort Leonard Wood. Yep. Went right back to Fort Leonard Wood for um, August to October of that year. I think uh, we got out on Halloween that year. So we came back on Halloween and came back to Michigan. And that's um, as a part time. 2002? 2003 now. 2003. So basic training would have been 2002, 2003. After I graduated high school, we would have went back to MP school. So it would have been October of 2003. Graduated that, came back home. Did you, so when you were at training, did you, did they do the pepper spray? We did. So I, okay. yep, at basic training, we got pepper sprayed. Uh, you know, had to run through, through that, fight through it. Um, been so, pepper sprayed a few times in my life, all for training purposes. So tell me a little bit about how, what they do when they do that. So yeah, um, that, you know, we, we lined up and one of the things was if you were going to be able to use it on somebody else, you had to experience what that pain felt like and and learn how to fight through it. And on the second side of that is if you ended up getting pepper sprayed, could you fight through it and continue to do your job? So we all did, we lined up, you know, the drill sergeant sprayed us right in the eyes, hit you with a pepper spray, and then you have to go through and, you know, find a guy that you're going to detain, um, fight through it, actually detain them, put handcuffs on them, take them to the ground and, you know, make that, make that arrest at the time. Um, so yeah, that was an interesting, interesting time to did, go through. So how long did it take for, for the peppers? They spray your face. And then yeah, it's, how it's did, like a, a couple seconds in and you're definitely feeling it. Um, I can tell you it lasts for hours on end. Once you think that it's over, as soon as you get some water on your eyes, it reignites itself. <laughs> so it starts burning again. Um, definitely got to drown yourself out, you know, make sure that that's completely washed off. But it's a couple days of, you know, you can t- continue to feel it. But for the first few hours, it's the worst and it, yep. it burns on there pretty good. So, so you, you finish, um, MOS training and you are now that that's considered a 31 Bravo military police. At the time it was actually a 95 Bravo. 95 Bravo. it turned into a 31 Bravo. So I became MOS queued, became qualified as a, an MP and, um, you know, returned back home. So I got to come back home and try and figure out, you know, what the next steps were. So from there, you know, I, I did, I came home. Um, like I said, it, it lasted through October. Uh, I knew that I was going to miss the first semester of, of college. So where were you planning on going? So I, I really didn't have a, a huge plan of what I was doing. My brother was at Central Michigan University. You know, that was one of the things I looked at, you know, going to college, trying to decide what was right for me. Um, but in the meantime, before the you know January class had started, I had actually went back and started working for Sergeant Miller again as a an ADOS, a recruiter's assistant. Um, and during that time, you know, now I had just turned 19 years old uh, in October. I turned 19, come back home uh, after I graduated. Um, really trying to decide what the next purpose of life would be. Um, from the time that I had graduated high school up until this current time, I was you know, working part time at the sheriff's department um, as a reserve officer down there. So I was, you know, really leaning my career that I was probably going to get into law enforcement. Um, what sheriff's office? So it would have been the Hillsdale County Sheriff's Department. Okay. I was a reserve down there for a few years. Um, at the time, you know, I applied for a position as a recruiter, um, was accepted. Uh, retired Sergeant Major Meshke hired me when he was a master sergeant. Eric Meshke. Eric Meshke hired me as a, a, a new recruiter. Um, came on and they hired me out of the Ypsilanti office. So I decided I was going to work full time, come on the AGR program. Um, Active Guard Reserve. Active Guard Reserve. You know, at 19 years old. It wasn't at that time, it wasn't something that a lot of people at my age and experience level were being offered. Tell me a little bit more like about the AGR program. So the AGR program is, you know, it's exactly that active guard reserve program. So it's a, you know, full-time program for national guard and reservists that they live, work here in the state of Michigan or whatever other state, you know, that they're assigned to. 
um, or the reserve unit that they're assigned to, but they're assigned to the, you know, compost twos and compost threes, which is not the active duty, right? So I wasn't, wasn't on the active duty side. I was on the national guard side, but I was still a full-time soldier. So all the same benefits that go along with it, you know, uh, 20 year retirement that mm-hmm. we're definitely, you know, looking at you and I both, you know, today as we're sitting here, um, have experienced and made it through that, you know, the, the health benefits, the pay, the, entitlements, everything that goes with it. You know, I put the uniform on every day and went to work. Um, so I, I got hired into the AGR program after working as a recruiter's assistant as a full-time recruiter. Um, went up to Ypsilanti for a short stint before I got moved to the Adrian office, which is no longer um, an office, no longer uh, armory. They closed that building down, but that's was really my first one. When- area that yeah. I, that I really started recruiting in, you know, that was downtown Adrian, right? Downtown Adrian, you know, Maumee so where Street, I met you the first time, probably right? Yeah. right there on Maumee street, you know, old castle building, really, really cool place. Um, Is that one five, six that was there one five, six, uh, signal unit that was there at the time. Um, obviously no longer there been decommissioned since then, but still a pretty cool building, pretty cool memories to have. Um, so yeah, started started recruiting there. Really got my first uh, go at it and my first successes in recruiting. Really, what was right your there, area? Like? Right there, out of there. So I worked both Lenaway County and Hillsdale County. Um, you know, I was a recent Hillsdale County grad. I played sports. You know, in high school, I knew a lot of the athletes and the coaches and the school systems real well. You know, it's kind of a small knit um, communities that are down there. So I found my first success in recruiting and found out that I was, I was pretty good at it. You know, at 19 years old, um, 19, 20 years old, right down there, uh, recruiting other kids that were 19, 20 years old, uh, you know, recruiting other people who were, you know, a little bit older than me, you know, really having really good success down there. I ended up, um, in the top three, my first year out as a rookie recruiter. That's good. Put in a lot of people out of that office. Um, it was an office that, you know, that hadn't seen those types of numbers before, um, hadn't seen that type of success out of it. Again, a lot of credit goes to, to Sean Miller. Um, he was a, one of the best peer recruiters, you know, that, that I have ever seen come through. And he, you know, taught me really what to do and, and how to do things. Um, again, a lot of credit's got to go to Mass Sergeant Meshke as well. Sergeant Major Meshke retired. Eric, um, still stay in contact with him today too, you know, but they give me a chance as, as a younger kid and you don't see that a lot. Mm-hmm. So I got a chance to go and, and I really did. I excelled at it, found a spot that I was really good at. At this point in my life, I was still really torn, um, you know, to go to a police academy and get into law enforcement or to stay um, on the AGR track so I talked to some friends in law enforcement and they all said, Joel, you're crazy. If you come, come become a cop, you don't want, you don't want to be a police officer. Um, go do that. You got better benefits. The pay is better. The promotion potential is better. You know, and a lot of that stuff, you don't understand at 19, 20 years old. But, um, I had some really great mentors and, um, you know, they, they helped me along with that decision-making process. So at that time I decided, Hey, I'm going to listen. And those mentors were like Sean and Eric. So those mentors and then also mentors that came from the law enforcement world. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so it it just, you know, the pay, the benefits working for a federal, you know, the federal government instead of a local or city government, um, you know, retirement, I'm retiring this year, right? Like 2023, I'm retiring my, my friends that were giving me this advice at the time, you know, some of those guys that were mentoring me were a couple of years older than me, you know, they're still working they're still going to be working for the next, next while. Right. So, um, our story, you know, we start collecting our benefits as soon as we retire. A lot of those positions don't, you know, you got to wait until you're 60 years old. So, um, it would have been a, would have been a lot different life choices, a lot of different changes, you know, to make, but I made some really good decisions when I was, when I was young, um, to put me in the position we're at today. Yep. So yeah, kind of going from there. Um, at the time I, I, I could have just kept recruiting, I was doing really, really good. Put in, you know, three years down in Adrian, um, coming up on, you know, now it's what, 2003, four, five, six, you know, 2006, you know, as we moved down the road, I continued to recruit. I continued to end up being, uh, you know, a top recruiter. I ended up making my master badge recruiter. Um, I, I was in the top five in the state numerous years in a row. So you started, you started in Ypsilanti and what year was that? So that would have been 2000, 
2004, 2003, 2004, after working at ADOS. So, um, and then you moved to Adrian. Then I moved to Adrian after about eight, nine months of, in Ypsilanti. There was a position close to home, so they moved me back down there. Um, so I did a, a couple years recruiting down there. I did three years you know, in recruiting. Um, and I was enlisting people, you know, 18, 17, 18 year old kids in high school, 19, 20, 21 year old kids. So now the war in Iraq has been kicked off. Afghanistan's kicked off, right? You know, um, people who I am enlisting are now getting deployed. Um, and I, I had never done that. You know, I, I went to basic training, went to school, you know, MP school, and then I came home. Right. Um, so that was kind of my story. But I, now I'm enlisting kids that are going into their units and, and they're getting deployed overseas. Um, so for me, I, I just didn't feel that it was right that I didn't, that I was enlisting people, talking people into something that I hadn't done myself. Um, so at that time I made a decision, um, to volunteer, to deploy. There was an email that actually came out and I'll give a shout out to Kelly Marshall. Um, she's a retired major actually living in Florida right now, um, She's part of my story later in life as well. But at the time, she was a staff sergeant. Uh, Kelly sent an email out that the state was looking for volunteer NCOs, um, MPs, to deploy. Uh, I responded to that email sitting at my desk late at night in Adrian one night. And I responded to say, yes, I, I wanted that opportunity. I wanted to volunteer um, to go to Iraq. So they jumped on it and said, yep, Joel, you can go with us. So uh, fast forward to 2007. And what what unit did you end up going with? So it was the MP Brigade, the 177 MP Brigade out of Taylor, Michigan. Um, went with the brigade headquarters. Uh, so that's 2007, April of April of 07. I left home for Texas, went down to Fort Bliss, Texas. Um, spent three months down there doing our pre mob what kind of things did you do for pre mob Yeah, so, man, we got down there and we did everything, convoy training and, you know, medical training and, uh, you know, just preparing for the hot that was going to come with, you know, living in the desert for a year. Was it hot in Fort Bliss when oh, you went Oh, man, there? Fort Bliss was hot. You know, Fort Bliss is right on the, the border down yep. there with Mexico, and we actually went out to a range called McGregor range that we lived at for a little bit. And if this was in the middle of the desert, it was actually in New Mexico, right on the, the Texas, uh, New Mexico border. Um, but that's where I did my pre mob stuff. And we went down there and, you know, trained with weapons on top of vehicles and patrols and how to do different things and went to different ranges and just getting ready for that, that year overseas, you know, and then medical training. And, um, I got certified as a, um, combatives instructor so we went oh, through nice. went through combatives training i got certified how to teach people how to um you know fight a little bit and went down there and did that for a while so we definitely went through our, our three months of training down there um and then deployed over to iraq so we were in baghdad from so um, when you when you went to fort bliss what type like what type of position were you in like a team leader position were so you in that's, headquarters? that's kind of a funny story there too so we you know i got pulled over um as a brigade headquarters and you know i was coming over as a recruiter uh pretty young kid i'm 23 years old at this time you know 22 22 23 years old at this time it's about 2004 2005 this is 2006, 2006. 2007 so no 2007 because I was, I was going 07 08 so it would have been 2007 now so i'm a you know 20 i think i was 22 at the time um, I had made rank pretty quick. I was very successful in recruiting in my early stages in recruiting. And when I got put in that position, it was an E7 position. So I got promoted clear up to E6 really fast. Um, so I was a young E6, pretty headstrong E6, um, but really didn't know what position I was going into. They knew that they needed MPs. So they sent me in the operational team and we're sitting in here doing a uh, command Structure. So operational team. So explain what that is. So as part of the three cell, um, we had a Lieutenant Colonel that was our, our three. Um, we ran everything in the brigade. So whether it was, you know, flight ops, three, or three cell means operations, operation cell. Okay. Yep. So we were the operation cell. So we, you know, anything that came through good, bad, and different was, was coming through our operations team, uh, running, you know, everything that was planning and purposes that uh, was going to happen, any of our movements, any of our, you know, missions that we were running, we we're the ones planning the missions and making sure they are operational when we were out there. Kind of like the, the hub for the 
definitely, definitely the hub of everything that's going on. Um, so we were doing one of our trainings, you know, down in Fort Bliss before we were ready to leave, um, knew that I was part of the operations team, but really didn't have a job that was specific there. And we had a retired three-star general who was part of the briefing, part of the training brief. And during it, he asked our, our three, who was uh, the Lieutenant Colonel who was actually in charge of the operations team. He asked him, he said, Hey, uh, John, he said, who is your flight ops guy? And there was a row of us sitting in the back, four or five NCOs that are in the back, kind of listening to this whole thing. And he looks back at me and he says, Sergeant Burkhardt is. The look on my face must have told him that I had no clue what the hell he was talking about. <laughs> because all of a sudden I got well thrown cold. in, all of a sudden I got thrown in as a brigade air NCO. So I've been an MP, trained, you know, understood law enforcement, understood the background. I was a really good recruiter, um, knew what I was doing. I had no clue what even an air NCO was. So after the briefing, um, he took me off to the side and he said, Hey, and I asked him, I said, what in the heck did you pick me for? He said, well, you're obviously a recruiter and you can work on your own. He goes, I need somebody that I can trust back there. That's going to be able to get it, you know, get things done and figure things out. So he, he made me the air NCO. So we get going and I, I still have no clue what this means. Um, turns out that I was going to be in charge of our basically largest moving piece that we did, um, overseas. So while we were overseas, uh, I ended up getting a mission give to me that I basically moved detainees across country. So I used C one thirties and C 17s and we moved bad guys back and forth for a year. Yeah. And I, I got to, I got to see, you know, and do a lot of things with a lot of really bad people um, for a year. And that, and that's what I did. I coordinated, you know, with the air force, I got to work with the, the CIA. I got to work with the FBI. I got to work with, you know, some really high intelligence side people during that year, um, moving people back and forth and, and doing things. Um, we would move from one end of the country to the other. Um, we were stationed, you know, out of Baghdad for, for that year. And, and we moved a lot of bad people, around the country without really getting into, you know, too much of exactly what I did. But yeah, I got told I was going to be the brigade air NCO. So found that out, um, deployed to Iraq, spent a year over there, you know, doing that, working with the command team, owning that mission, you know, working with other MPs that were attached to us, um, bringing, you know, bad guys in and, and getting them all, you know, put in the detainment camps and, and releasing bad guys is too, right. we didn't always, you know, keep them on there. So when they would get released, we'd, you know, do some of those releases. Um, a lot of work done over there. So when you were there, did you, did you guys lose anyone? We did not. So we were very, very fortunate. Um, nobody out of the brigade headquarters. Um, we didn't lose anybody there. We did have people that we lost, um, assigned to us. Um, but nobody that was, um, with us directly in our unit. So we, we took the whole unit, left together and the whole unit came back together. That's good. Yeah. It very, wasn't very often back then. No, it's, you know, it, it, it wasn't, we did a, a lot of things over there, you know, and that was a really good piece of my career too. Not only did I get to say that, you know, I did during that time frame. you know, there was not a lot of people who had deployed at that time in the military. And then it ramped up to a lot of people had deployed and pretty much everybody had, had gone over to a combat zone. Um, and now it's kind of evening back out again, where a lot of younger kids have not had that experience of um, combat and, and been in combat and, you know, have, have done those, those types of deployments, which I think is a good thing. Um, you know, I mean, hopefully we don't have to continue to, to do that. Um, but I got to meet a lot of people, you know, and you understand things differently too. When you live through those types of circumstances with people, um, grew some really, really good friendships. Uh, Chris and Christina Knight both, um, deployed with me. Um, they were, you know, both AGR soldiers as well, but developed those bonds and those friendships and, you know, friendships that'll end up lasting forever. Um, my actual roommate, Tom Kamarowski, um, shout out to him real quick. He has passed away since, um, died of cancer when he came back, but Better to hear um, that he was my roommate that we were overseas and, you know, really, really tight bond with him. Um, and then, you know, guys, general Nevin was our, uh, you know, the geo that, that took us over. Um, general stone was our full Fulberg Colonel stone at the time. Um, 
you know, he was, he was our, our Colonel that was over there. And then, you know, just other multiple guys that you have that, that relationship and that bond with it, you know, you can't really find it anywhere else, um, other than serving through tough times with people. So, um, while we was overseas, um, just before I was deployed, I found out that uh, I was going to have a, a child. Um, I was overseas in December. Well, it would have been November. Um, my daughter was supposed to be born in December. I uh, had planned leave to come home on that. Got a Red Cross message in November. And my oldest daughter, who is today 15 years old, will be 16 this November coming up. Uh, JC was born. Um, so actually talking about General Stone, he signed a uh, release for me to, to leave country to be able to come back as my daughter was going to be born a little bit early. So I got to come home to, to try and catch her being born. Um, showed up a few hours late, but I, I got to be there, you know, and see her in the hospital, which was pretty cool. And I, I do appreciate him still to this day, you know, signing that red cross message as the message came in and let me get out of theater, which was a whole another, you know, flying from Baghdad, Iraq to Kuwait, and then jumping, oh, on, a, jumping on a plane from Kuwait to fly 24 hours to, um, where did I come in at? Uh, Baltimore. Landed in Baltimore. Flew from Baltimore to Chicago. From Chicago to Detroit. From Detroit to Lansing. To my buddy picked me up and took me to the hospital. You know to, to see my my baby. Uh, you know be born, which was <laughs> which was pretty cool. So um, so we're, so JC, are you and and Jasmine married at, at? No. So that that was uh, Jasmine is, is not JC's mom. Um, so whole story, we'll get into that as we move. Um, but JC was born. So my oldest daughter was born while I was deployed. Um, finished out my deployment, went back to Iraq, finished out my deployment there. Um, came home in April of 08, May, I think May 5th, we actually came back home and I might be off on that date. So it'd be, we actually got back into Michigan in May of, uh, 2008. So came back home, um, goes back to Mass Sergeant Meshke is now Sergeant Major Meshke. Um, you know, asked me really where I wanted to be. Uh, my daughter was up here near Lansing. Um, I've always been told that all roads in the AGR program lead to Lansing. That's Very where our, our headquarters is, you know, the, the roads up here in Lansing. So I figured, you know, it's a good time for me to make a move. So I moved to Holt, um, just South of Lansing. And I, I got a position right here, here in Lansing. Um, office partner, you know, Joe Frederick, this is the first time I met that guy came back home in 2008. He was just got hired as a brand new recruiter. And the two of us worked together, um, for the short next nine months, um, came back on as a recruiter, Tom Kaiser. This is where I really, he kind of comes into my story, still a mentor today. Um, still a great friend, another retiree. Um, Tom Kaiser ended up being my boss, Mass Sergeant Kaiser at the time here in Lansing, um, worked out of our headquarters building here in Lansing for about eight, nine months. Um, and then they asked me to move to Michigan State University as a recruiter. So at that time, you know, early 2009, we're talking like January 2009, um, I'm, I made the move to Michigan State as an on-campus recruiter. And what's um, the difference between? So as a, a regular recruiter, you know, you're working, uh, helping put people in, um, working with high school kids, working with prior service enlistments, anybody, you know, that, that wants to join the Michigan Army National Guard and really work in your cities, different different areas that you have around, around um, you know, your office. So as an on-campus recruiter, I was strictly at Michigan State University working with the ROTC department. Uh, it was, you know, comprised of a, a PMS, which is the professor of military science, usually a lieutenant colonel. And then they have a SMI, which is your senior military instructor is a E8 usually um, at these different, excuse me, different positions. Um, so that's where I, I got to come in. And then there's obviously a staff um, mixed of, you know, majority of active duty soldiers, a um, couple national guardsmen, a couple of reservists here or there. Um, as we get into Michigan State University, I came down there, I walked into what possibly may be one of the best teams that, that I had ever been part of. Um, so here I was dual hatted, you know, I was a recruiter on a recruiting team for the National Guard that had a specific mission to, you know, put people in the Michigan Army National Guard. And Mass Sergeant Kaiser was my boss. Um, really, you know, anything that I needed, he was there for, but he really let us do our thing. And he was not a micromanager. He really, you know, let us That's lead. Um, Hard to find. And, and we had a heck of a team, man. Joe Frederick, Jared Johnson, uh, Jaeger, who's still around, was there. And a guy named Bryce Merriman, who's uh, down in Texas right now. So that was the team. 
we were supposed to have more recruiters than that. Um, but we ended up leaving them unfilled and we made mission with just the five of us. We made an eight man mission with five of us and we had a really good team and, and, you know, he let us do our thing. And I think that's the success behind it. So, um, you know, Master Sergeant Kaiser, he, he knew what needed to be done, but he also had trust in us to make sure we got it done. And, you know, very successful out at Michigan State. But I also walked into the second part of my job now is working at the ROTC and building those relationships out there. Um, this is where, you know, now Colonel Wag comes into my story. Um, at the time, what Major year Wag. is this? So this would be 2009. 2009. Yep, early 2009. So I was there from 2009 to 2012. So Colonel Wag, another guy named Colonel Lee Pack, um, definitely, you know, great leaders, great people to be out with, you know, helping teach young people coming in how to be officers in, in the army. Um, you know, just really, really good team, um, of people who really had your back down there ended up meeting, you know, he's probably one of my best friends now. His name's Rick Stiver, another great mentor, um, that was down there. Just great group of people that ended up becoming, you know, friends for a long period of time. So I spent, you know, three years at Michigan state doing that. Um, recruiting again, great successes at Michigan state, top 10 recruiter, you know, multiple years in a row, top two, top three recruiters, multiple years in a row. Um, from there I was brought in, um, by talked about Kelly Marshall earlier. And now Sergeant major Marshall is the CSM of the recruiting battalion. And he, uh, had brought me into his office and he asked, you know, what I really wanted to do. And his recommendation for me was, you know, to come up to headquarters and, and learn something on a different basis, right? I'd been a recruiter now for quite a while. I've been an on-campus recruiter. I've been a field recruiter and I was very successful at, at all of that. So he brought me up and he ended up making me the operations NCO, um, came up and I worked for Sergeant Major Leffel. So Randy Leffel, another shout out to, you know, another great mm-hmm. guy that uh, influenced my life quite a bit, but um, I worked directly for him. So I got to go up to the headquarters and and really start learning processes and and, and how we do things on the back end of recruiting and and helping the recruiting team out from a a larger perspective. So um, that's where I got to know a lot of people and and do a lot of things. So was there any, any recruits specifically that you like remember like, Hey, I really changed this person's life. You know, that, that's a great question. And, you know, it really goes back. I, there's, there's a handful, right? Um, I can tell you a a story about one in particular, and this is when I was in Adrian. Um, this guy had a stepdad who was an alcoholic, um, and his stepdad put his hands on him. Um, the kid's mom actually came to me uh, and talked to me and, I had a conversation with that guy afterwards and I think it really helped spring forward uh, his life and getting him out of that house and out of that situation. So um, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of people that, you know, you helped change the direction of that their life went in or could have went in. Um, Really one of the driving things that helped me the whole time was helping people. Right. And, And that there was a lot of that. Not only like, you know, really getting them out of bad situations, but just putting them on the right track and being that mentor for a lot of younger people um, to come up to and talk to and wanted to really be like you. They always say you recruit in your own image. So, you know, successful people are, you know, usually have people that want to be like them around them. And that's kind of usually what you see. So, yeah, there's there's quite a few different stories out there um, of people that I that I helped along the way, or at least I, I like to think that I helped along the way. Let's take a quick break. Veterans Archives is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we rely on donations from our listeners. If you are enjoying these stories and would like to support our continued efforts, please go to www.veteransarchives.org and select the donate button. Thank you. So, so yeah, great story. Great example. Um, so now, so now you're at operations. Yeah. So roll right into operations with the recruiting battalion, you know, spent a lot of my, 
pretty much all my career in the recruiting battalion. Um, rolled into that three years up there learning, you know, the backside, learning how to help process waivers, you know, listening to retirees what types of waivers? like Jack Duffy, you know, who would do medical waivers or, you know, if a kid had a, you know, some type of legal charge, you know, something that was disqualifying, but we could end up doing waivers for, I'd help, you know, get those waivers processed through, um, medical waivers that were going up to NGB, just making sure things were right. Uh, making sure the MEPs were, you know, running the way they should, um, getting applicants here and there. And really that day to day, everything that goes into helping a hundred recruiters across the street, you know, I was that, that daily phone call for, you know, 10 NCICs and, and a hundred recruiters that if they needed something, they were calling me. And I was kind of the heartbeat of, of what was going on during that time. So from there, um, I moved back out to Jackson area, um, as a team leader running a recruiting team, you know, had some great guys specifically on my team. Um, Couple years there, moved back up to headquarters. Now, who were some of those guys that were on your team? So, we had a, we had a pretty good team down there. Um, Rick Santana, you know, one of the guys that stayed with me, one of my really good friends now. Um, Brandon Dunn is uh, was with me when I was down there. Michael Engel um, was on my team down there, and then you know there was many others that kind of came and went as we did. Um, but yeah, we had a really, really good team down there. Uh, got to do, you know, quite a bit of things, help learn, help teach the new recruiters. As what they year were you down through. there? Man, I'm going to get blurred now. So I went 2009 to 12, 12 to 12, 13, 14, 14, 15. This is 2014, 15 years. Um, right around there, somewhere in those years, I guess, as we start going back and looking mm-hmm. at them. So, so somewhere in that time frame, I was down there as an E7, um, had been promoted and now I'm a Sergeant first class senior NCO. And, you know, I was down there. So did that for a while, you know, led teams got to do some, you know, neat stuff down there too. And, you know, bring events to different towns and cities, um, as a leader got to, you know, really help train new recruiters coming on and teach them really how to do things the right way. From there, uh, I had an opportunity to come back up to headquarters and start working in retention. Um, so I did that as a, a brigade retention NCO. So I, now I flipped the switch on what I was doing instead of bringing people into the, the guard. I was trying to keep them in the Michigan Army National Guard, helping people you know, get their bonuses that they've been through, get their education benefits that they've been through, help them with medical uh, insurance, make sure their insurance was up, you know, and really now become a personnelist. Um, not that I wasn't doing personnel stuff the entire time as we were recruiting people, but really getting on that human resources side of the house and um, ensuring that people were getting what they were they were promised from their recruiters, you know, and now I'm on the backside helping out with that. Um, ended up taking over as the state retention NCO, got to lead some, some good programs, um, got recognized, you know, through NGB and got asked to come down to the national guard bureau, um, and rewrite how we did retention. So I got to, as a state retention NCO, there was a group of us from about seven different states around the country that came together, um, sat down for two weeks and really tore out retention and and what we do and how we're going to keep soldiers in the Army. Like, what what's our benefits of why should somebody stay with the Michigan Army National Guard? Why should somebody stay with the National Guard as a whole? And um, like I said, there was about seven of us that went down there and rewrote the entire training program for retention. Um it's pretty cool that I got to be part of, of something like that, you know, on the national level, um, writing some policy. So did that for a while, ended up getting promoted, um, to E8. So let's back up a little yep. bit. So at this time you have, you've had one, one child and yeah, so let's go, let's go back. So I am, let's talk about my family for a little bit. So 2012 ish. Um, I am, where am I even at now? I think I'm at headquarters working. I'm at headquarters. So during that time I end up, um, my wife and I started dating, um, Jasmine, who is, who's my wife. We started dating and, uh, had our first kid, Jordan. So Jordan's born in 2013, January, 2013, Jasmine, uh, Jordan is born. So, um, so Jasmine, as we got married, uh, also had Jade, 
Um, so we each had one child. Both of them um, were roughly the same age. They're about a month away from each other. So oh, that's nice. we get together and we have a couple three year olds. Um, when we got together, our kids are three, just turning four years old when we first got together. Um, and then we got married. Jasmine and I got married. So now we have our two daughters. So we have Jade and JC. Um, fast forward into January 2013. Our daughter Jordan is born. Um, so now we have three girls. We have JC, Jade, and Jordan. Jasmine's my wife. Joel's my name. So we decided we're going to stick with the J's. We're going to keep going. Um, a couple months later, Jordan's born. Uh, we get through 18 months later. Her brother Jackson's born. Kind of rounds out our family. Now we've got four. Uh, had a little boy on the last one. So now we've got three daughters and my son. Um, you know, growing family still living in Holt. Um, my son's born in June, the same week that my son is born. We closed on our house and moved into the house that we're sitting in right now here in Mason. Um, so just off of Barnes Road in Mason down here now where my kids have kind of grown up for the last nine years, um, that we've been down here. So yeah, we made some moves, you know, I moved after I got back from Iraq to the Lansing area, stayed close, you know, and we kind of found our home right here as we grew our family um, right here in Mason. And, you know, it's a really supportive community. Um, I couldn't have asked for a whole lot more. Uh, pretty blessed to be out here. But yeah, Jasmine, you know, as I was making these moves, um, continue to, you know, stay with me, stay by my side, support me through those moves as we start, you know, having our children and, and our children are growing, you know, continue to do that. Um, I will say, you know, super, super proud of my wife. Uh, she ended up going back and getting her nursing degree. She went to Davenport University right here in Lansing and uh, got her nursing degree and, and kicked that off. And she's a, a rock star now, um, you know, been in the nursing field for years now uh, and, uh, you know, really crushed it. Um, went out and, and now she's, you know, continuing to do her thing. So as our families continue to evolve, we continue to grow with it, you know, as we did, um, taking us through right there, you know, working in Lansing, at, coming off of the state retention NCO position. Um, I had got promoted, uh, accepted a position, a promotion back out to Ypsilanti. That's where you and I got to, to work together yeah. for a little bit. I got promoted to E8. So I was a master sergeant now taking over as the new master sergeant out in, uh, Ypsilanti area, you know, running, while there's a lot of changes happening at that time, you know, and, and trying to keep those changes um, from affecting the recruiters on the field and letting the recruiters do their jobs. Um, you and I had talked before we kicked this off, you know, there's a lot of uh, personnel, personality. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, differences and um, especially in recruiting, you know, dealing with those, those personalities. And, you know, if there's a time that I look back on, you know, obviously I knew that going into that, strong personalities, you know, definitely collided there. Um, and, and it was good because I, I felt like I was there for the guys and, and I was really a, a people's NCYC, you know, uh, for the soldiers that were out there for the recruiters. Helping I would them, agree with that. Helping 100%. them get through what they were doing. So I, I've got, you know, I didn't lose any sleep at night. Um, I definitely feel good about what we accomplished while we were out there. Um, and, and you know, I, I really feel like I hopefully I, I made some difference in, in some of the lives as a leader uh, for the people and, you know, the recruiters that were in that southeastern portion of the state. So move through that time frame, you know, different positions that as changes happen over there, um, came back up to marketing um, and officer recruiting uh, as, as an E8, came back up to headquarters area. Um, and that's just kind of where I figured that it's time for it was really time for me to end my career now. You know, I spent, you know, 20 years in, in recruiting, got to do a lot of cool things as a recruiter. I got to, you know, go travel around to different places. I, I've been to, you know, the Virgin Islands on trips and Colorado on trips and all over the United States on different trips because I was, you know, a successful recruiter. And, you know, as a leader, I got to lead people and, you know, see them in their good times and their bad times and really help them and mentor them. Um, you know, and there was a lot of changes that happened. And I looked at the the pros and cons and the benefits and I looked at my family and my family's growing and I'm, I'm glad you, you know, stop me for a second and, and talk about them, right? Because that's the most important part. And 
Um, for me, it was a decision to really like sit back. My wife has a career that she's, you know, doing really well in it. And we really want to, you know, give her that opportunity to, to excel there too. And, you know, I wanted to be there for, for my kids as they're growing right now. Um, and give them that time to be at their sports. You know, I, I got to coach my son's baseball team this summer, you know, really, really cool thing. My daughter, you know, loves soccer. Um, my older girls, you know, they do what they do and in, in 4-H and, you know, art and being able to, to handle there. And I, and I wanted to be here to be part of that with them. Um, and then looking at like, who gets to retire when they're 38 years old. Yeah. No kidding. So I kind of looked at the pros and cons and talked to people like you that decided they were going to retire. And you know, the people that I've mentioned before and the Eric Meshkies and the Sean Millers and the Randy Leffels and the Tom Kaisers and everybody who really came before me, um, that had talked to me and not once had I heard anybody say that they wish they would have stayed in longer. Everybody said, do your 20 years. It's definitely worth doing 20 years, but retire. Like get to that retirement point and do it. Um, nobody that I've talked to says, man, I, I just wish I would have done four or five more years. Everybody's really happy. They get to that retirement point and they retire and, you know, they go on and see the next piece of their life. So for me, it was, you know, I'm, I'm 38 years old now and, uh, I had the opportunity to retire from the military at, at a 38 years old. So I decided I was going to do it. Um, and that's kind of where we are today, you know, as we draw down onto it and look at that next chapter in life. Um, so you went to, so when you went to Fort Knox to, to retire, like you signed out, what was the feeling that you had when you actually signed out? Man, I can tell you, um, it wasn't that long ago, right? So it's really, really fresh in my mind. So my wife was not able to, to make that trip down there with me. Um, so I, I went down to Fort Knox and my aunt lives 15 minutes from Fort Knox, um, down in Louisville, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. Um, so I went down the night before and I stayed with my aunt, and my uncle, um, stayed down there and my mom actually traveled down with me. Um, so my mom comes down with me, travels down to my aunt's house and she went with me the day I signed out. So it, you go through a whole bunch of stuff that probably could have been sent to you in an email, um, get, get everything done. And then I went in and I actually sat down with the lady and, you know, I had to do that after lunch. So I went through the morning, you get through all your briefs that you have to go through and they tell you about, and then you got to sign it. So basically you can't come back on them later and say, I never got told this. Um, so you sign all your stuff that you really don't understand. And then after lunch, I came back and I sat down with my lady who was doing my out processing and she showed me my 214 that I signed. And I was like, all right, this kind of hit me. And then she set that retirement order in front of me and it hit me really hard, Brian, <laughs> like, like a ton of bricks. Um, cause you're thinking about, you know, the last 20 years, like we sit here and talk today, you know, all that goes through your mind so fast and it becomes real that, you know, even though you've been talking about retirement for a year, uh, two years, however long you've been talking about it, the day that you actually sign that thing is like, it's real. Yeah. Oh yeah. And she hands you a certificate that says retired. Yep. Master Sergeant Burkhart retired. Like, that's kind of like, what do I do now? <laughs> like, what's, what's next? It's almost like getting you know? out of prison. Right. You know, so like the, the entire time since I've been 17 years old, I've had this direction. I've stayed in this organization. I've been very loyal to this organization. And I always knew that, you know, what, even if things weren't right, things weren't good, you know, you knew that you had a home. Well, like that home was no longer going to be there. And you really didn't know what the next step was. So yeah, signing that hit me like a ton of bricks. There's emotions, you know, happy. Um, I don't, I don't think anything was sad, maybe some nervousness. Um, but for 20 years of my life, 21 years and nine months, um, you know, when it's finally said and done, um, you put everything into that one career, you know, every day I woke up and, and had a uniform on that said my last name and said, you know, U S army on it. And that's, you signed a piece of paper that basically said that your life's going away. And, um, or I, I don't like beginning? to look at it. And that's what I was just going to say. I don't like to look at it like that because the book's not closed, right? You just traded the chapter. So that chapter is over and it's time to start a new chapter in life and, and, and really, and move on with it. But, um, you know, the decision, 
to make it, you asked about that day, like it, it hits you pretty hard on that day. Cause you have those mixed emotions that are going through, but really at the end, you know, you make that decision to close that chapter, not, not the whole, the whole book. So it's only starting and, and you get to see everything that's, that's next that comes with it. So you, so you retire, you get, you get your, uh, certificate, your retirement certificate in 214. And then you start at a new job, correct? <laughs> Yeah. So I, I'm, we're on our way home. And like I said, my mom rode down with me to Kentucky. I think it was like a six hour drive or something like that from Fort Knox to here, five and a half, six hours, something like that. So we're maybe halfway home, not even halfway home. And we're just, you know, we got out of there at like two, three o'clock in the afternoon and we just decided to push through that night. Um, maybe it was earlier than that. I don't know. But anyway, we, we decided to just drive through that day, get home real quick, not stay the night down in Kentucky for another ride. So I'm about halfway home and I get a phone call and I look at my phone and I'm like, well, this is interesting. So I'd been talking to a company, um, a few months ago that, you know, was recruiting me to, to come on and, um, you know, bring human resources under the corporate umbrella for them. And they had you know seen how I did in recruiting and that I've led recruiting teams and, um, you know, I've done retention and I've seen the backside and I was in marketing and I, I was the director of marketing for the marketing department. So I'd had all these things that really had been around human resources, even though I'd you know never had that title of human resources specialist, but we've done everything in human resources, right? We've yep. onboarded people, we've yep. offboarded people, we've helped with benefits. We've, we've done everything that that you do in human resources as being a recruiter and a retainer and um, you know, marketing and, and specializing and building that brand. Um, so I, I got a call from a company, um, and it said, Hey, would you be, are you still interested? I know we, we had talked a few months ago. Um, and I know it didn't work out at the time, but would you still be interested in coming in? I think that we're going to open this position up now. And I was like, Hey, you know, sure. Why not? Let's do it. So I'm on my way home from signing out and I get a phone call from M Shapiro real estate group who I'm currently working with today, um, asking me to come in and interview the next day. I got up and drove over to Farmington and, and met with the president of the company, uh, Mark Kassab at the time, uh, you know, and the next day I had an offer letter and accepted the offer letter. And, and I'm currently working for him right now as the human resources manager, um, for M Shapiro real estate group. That's awesome. And what has been, the biggest or one of the hardest things or some of the hardest things in your transition going from military to civilian job. You know, (laughs) so we talked about when you first came in, right? Like, uh, I guess, what do I wear every day? (laughs) Right. Like every day I got up and I, I put on a uniform to go to work. Um, and if I didn't wear a uniform, we were wearing, you know, khakis and a a polo that said Michigan army national guard on it pretty much knew what you were going to wear every day. So now we we get up and I don't don't know what I'm supposed to wear to work. Right. Like how do, how do people do this? Um, but no, all, all joking aside, like, um, it's been a great transition, um, working with, you know, some really great people. Um, but at the same time, they, the way we speak, the way we do things as veterans, the way we do things in our organization isn't the way that is done in the civilian world in a lot of organizations. Um, it's just finding those those processes, those procedures, the way that they do things there, um, transitioning to that, transitioning to um, a little bit different than the way we do it. You know, in the military, it's, you know, you have a rank structure. Um, and, and you work off that rank structure and, and everybody knows how that rank structure works. So in the civilian world, it, it may not always be that cut and dry on, you know, who's where and what, and, you know, reports to who or who's level with who and on what level, um, do you work at and, you know, who's your peers, who's your, not your peers, who's here and there. So it's, a, it's really interesting, um, kind of to see the other side of it and, you know, work with these people at some pretty high level positions, you know, being able to, to see and get that mentorship on a little bit different note than what we came from. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really glad that you landed where you landed and you're, you're doing well. Is there, is there anything that you would like someone to take away from our conversation if they were to listen to it? You know, after 20 years of doing what we've done, Brian, you know, you sit back and and we've done a lot of things, right? So, um, I'm really big into people, you know, you, you worked directly for me for a very short period of time, you know, and we had some 
really good conversations, you know, when we were there, um, stayed in contact, continue to have those conversations, but something that I, I really try and instill in everybody. Um, cause I do really care about people. And I think that's kind of my mantra on, on where I go, but is find a mentor for somebody. Um, be a mentor. If you're able to mentor people, take the time to, to build people and people will pay off to you in the backside. Um, Eric Meschke, going back to him when I was a, a young E4, maybe E5, when I first started working for him, he looked at me and he said, hey, young stud, uh, <laughs> you never know what's important to somebody else. You know, and that may not have made a lot of sense at the time, but it's a lot of truth behind that. Absolutely. If something, just because you tell me something, it may not be important to me. It may not be important to me that your wife, her birthday is tomorrow. And she's turning 40 years old. That may not be important to me, but it is to you. So if it's important to you now as a leader, it's also important to me. Um, so that's the, that's the, you know, message I would just kind of, you know, if somebody listens to this 20 years from now, 30 years from now, hundred years from now, and you know, you're really thinking about people, um, invest in people. And if it's important to somebody else, you know, you never know what's important to somebody else. Thank you for listening to another episode of Veterans Archives, the podcast that brings you the story of the men and women who have created and lived our military history. If you or someone you know served in the military and would like to share your story with Veterans Archives, please go to www.veteransarchives.org, select the Apply Now button, and fill out our application, and someone will get right back with you. Veterans Archives is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we rely on the donations of our listeners. If you are enjoying these stories and you support our efforts, please go to www.veteransarchives.org and select the Donate button. Any donation is certainly appreciated. Look for Veterans Archives on your favorite social media. We are on LinkedIn. Instagram, and Facebook. Just look for Veterans Archives. Like, follow, and share our page. We'd certainly appreciate it. If you or someone you know is a veteran and you are struggling with mental health issues, please dial 988 and select option 1 for the Veterans Crisis Hotline. Please be sure to tune in next time for the next episode of Veterans Archives.